Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84, and today we're going to be focusing on Apple's portable line of computers, their PowerBooks from the 1990s. This particular machine is a PowerBook 150, and like its brothers and sisters, these things are not too happy these days. So let's take a look at what's going on with these systems and how we can make them a bit happier in this day and age. But first, Happy Marchintosh, everybody! That's right, it is Marchintosh once again, the month that we celebrate all things Macintosh. To learn more about Marchintosh and to see other cool content other people have created, go to Marchintosh.com or follow Marchintosh on social media. Today we're going to be looking at power books like this PowerBook 150. This is a low-end model from 1994. It still has a passive matrix grayscale screen. It doesn't even have an ADB port, so you're stuck with that keyboard and trackball. But you know what? It was the lower end of the line, and that's what Apple gave you. But that's not to say that there weren't some awesome power books released in the day. I have a few of them in my collection, but not all of them. My friend Ron of Ron's Computer Videos has an extensive collection of power books that he's trying to get up and running. But unlike Apple's desktops, power books can be a bit more challenging to get going. A lot of the desktops share a lot of similar parts, memory, expansion cards, etc., but the power books are their own unique beast and usually not offering a lot of compatibility as far as accessories or power cords or anything like that between models, so that can be a bit frustrating, especially if you're just getting into collecting vintage Macs. These machines are great to collect, but can unfortunately be very difficult to repair, even if you have some experience in the area. So today we're going to be looking at some power books like this 150 and some other models, and talk about some of their pitfalls and things to be aware of before you end up purchasing your next power book. PowerBooks are great compact systems, but unless the PowerBook you're picking up has all of its cables, plenty of memory, and is in good working order, I'd suggest considering starting your vintage Mac collection with the desktop and then looking into the portables later on. One of the biggest issues that people come across when working with PowerBooks is, unfortunately, the screen. Now, even if your PowerBook has been kept in great condition, there are a few issues that you could run into. One particularly nasty issue is called vinegar syndrome. And while I'm not going to pretend to know the exact scientific facts about what's going on here, essentially the layers of the screen start to separate and cause this visible damage. Now some very lucky individuals have actually tackled this problem and have actually replaced one of those layers of the screen, like the polarizer, in hopes of restoring the display. And in some cases, their results were excellent. Just by looking at some of the videos of people doing this, I get a bit squeamish knowing that if you're just slightly off or you pull too hard or do something different, uh, yeah, things can go bad real fast. One of the other big problems we see with these power books is something called tunnel vision. Essentially, when these machines are left on for a period of time, the displays start to have black borders around the corners, looking sort of like you're peering into a tunnel. Apparently, moisture can get in between the layers of the LCD and can cause those areas to darken. Some people have had success baking these LCD displays at very low temperatures to try and resolve this issue. Johan from the channel The Basement did an excellent video about trying to solve this tunnel vision problem on their PowerBook 170. After baking parts of it for over 9 hours, they were quite successful, so be sure to check out their video for details, and please subscribe to their channel, they do amazing work. And lastly, one of the biggest problems with these displays is related to our good old friend, electrolytic capacitors. Unfortunately, the capacitors on the display, the display board, or the inverter board love to leak and cause havoc. This could be as simple as causing the brightness and contrast knobs not to really do anything on the display, or to give you a completely blank screen when you turn on the machine. Thankfully, some of the early PowerBook 100 series models do share similar displays, so a lot of the capacitors are well known throughout the community, and you could check out web pages like my own, or a few of these awesome examples to understand what parts are needed for what displays, etc. Now, it's not surprising that 30 year old capacitors need to be replaced. However, it's a bit more troubling on these PowerBooks because they could kind of be a pain to take apart. With one bad move, you could snap that ribbon cable, and then your PowerBook won't be displaying much of anything anymore. Unfortunately, recapping PowerBooks isn't as easy as recapping desktop computers. There's a lot less room to work with, there's a lot of plastic, a lot of delicate cables, and if you screw up, it's harder to find parts for a laptop as it is for desktop computers, in most cases. Usually the capacitors on the display of the PowerBooks are located next to plastic bits, ribbon cables, and other very sensitive areas. I would caution anybody who has not done this type of delicate work before to stop here. I'm serious, if you want to tinker around with this stuff, that's great, and I fully encourage you to do so. However, 
you should practice before you just start diving into a classic machine. There's a lot of factors with these vintage computers that can make it harder for you to get a grip on your soldering skills. I'd highly recommend doing one of those practice soldering boards that are available online. They're low cost and it allows you to get an understanding if you have the feel for this sort of stuff or if you'd rather leave it to somebody else to do for you. With that being said, I have a special PowerBook 165 model that I need to get up and running again. This machine was dropped off to me by my bestest friend in the world, Luke Miani. Here's a video of us just hanging around a few weeks ago. Hey guys, I'm here in the basement with my new best friend, Luke Miani. Uh, hey, hey. How you doing there? What you, what you working on? Wait. What the? I'm out of here. Ah, memories. We will cherish them. Anyway, the PowerBook 165 he brought in wasn't in too rough shape. It actually looks beautiful on the outside, and the screen is pretty darn sharp. However, this display is a passive matrix display. It's never going to look as sharp and as clear as your TFT or your later active matrix displays. These are always going to have a bit of smearing and a bit of line blur and things like that. However, that's not particularly the case on this PowerBook. The display looks pretty good. However, I'm going to recap it anyway because I have to get in there. And the reason I have to get in there is because of the inverter board. The problem with this particular PowerBook is the brightness and contrast knobs don't seem to really do anything. Or if they do something, it just totally blows the picture out of proportion. Or if you adjust it, it just kind of stays there for a second and then just goes to crap. So it's one of those things that you have to replace the capacitors for. And if I'm in there already, I might as well do the display. Now, I previously worked on a PowerBook 160 and 165 display for my friend Mike of Mike's Mac Shack. Unfortunately, his was in much worse shape. You could see some of the photos here of it really smearing and looking terrible. Thankfully, a recap of that made it look almost just like new, and it's really hard to tell in some of these scenarios that this is a passive matrix screen, but it's not too bad for your lower cost option grayscale display. Luke also stopped by with a PowerBook 180C. I've never actually used one of these machines before, so it was really cool to see in person. Now, unfortunately, although this is not a passive matrix display, it's kind of looking like it. This active matrix display on the PowerBook 180C was not looking the best. And so, unfortunately, I think that's going to be needing some recapping too, but that'll be for another day. All right, enough chit chat. Let's take a look at that PowerBook 165 and see if we get that display working better again. First things first is removing all the screws from the PowerBook. There are take apart guides online. I strongly suggest you follow them. Once the LCD is free, you're not done yet. You have to carefully remove this EMI shielding. You have to worry about removing the screws on the back of this white casing. And of course, all the cables, etc. You want to do this in an area where you have plenty of space available. And you also want to try and limit the amount of dust or hair that could get on the display because you will be fully exposing the rear of the display. You have to do this in order to get to those capacitors because it would be impossible to replace them with that cover still on. So I know the lighting isn't the best here, but what I've done is I've put the display in an anti-static bag, and that's to protect it from dust and heat and any other crap that's going to go on here while I'm removing these capacitors. First I'm going to deal with these caps that are furthest away from everything. Uh, you could see that, yeah, it's uh, pretty nasty there. So even though we weren't seeing too many problems, there's clear problems there. I'm not going to use heat on these capacitors in this area. I think it's a little bit too risky. Um, so I'm going to try and do this batch with the soldering iron. We'll see how that goes. If you apply fresh solder to these pads, it should make these a little bit easier to remove. And this PCB is so thin, I wouldn't even dream of twisting this cap off. There we go. Oh yeah, just look at all that stuff hiding under that capacitor. Just goes to show you, even if the screen looks okay or the machine boots okay, those caps are still leaking. I'm glad this isn't smell vision because this stinks.
right, with all of those caps successfully removed, let's put our first new capacitor on the board. I'm choosing to use tantalum style capacitors here simply because those are the ones that I had on hand. I'm going to attach this as close as I can to this pad. So I'll make this a little bit easier on myself for the other side. And we want to be very careful. Let's just give it a gentle nudge. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. Perfect. In most cases, you're going to want to wick away that old solder to make sure that any of the capacitor goo or any of that junk that was in that old solder is now gone. You can see this board is very thin and very delicate and some of that solder mask is coming off. That's okay as long as that doesn't expose or bridge anything it shouldn't. You shouldn't have to worry about it. It's very important that your replacement capacitors are the right size, otherwise you're going to have a lot of problems loading them onto the new board. They just won't fit and it'll make your job a lot harder for you. All right, excellent. That's the last of the caps on. Now let's move on to the inverter board. This provides power to the LCD and also controls the brightness and contrast. There were two little capacitors here, which we removed. Now it's time to put new caps on the board. And of course, nothing is as easy as you think it'll be. Here is where I ran into some issues. I opted to replace these through hole capacitors with tantalum capacitors, which made it really tricky in order to get my iron where it had to go. To make matters worse, the other capacitor was too big and I couldn't get it in a smaller size, so I had to scrape away some of the solder mask here in order to solder the negative connection. This is the interconnect board that connects to the logic board of the PowerBook and also connects to the display and the keyboard. Unfortunately, there is a battery on here for the PRAM and I do not have a replacement in stock. Apparently, those particular types of batteries are hard to come by these days. I did end up cutting out that battery from the board as I didn't want it to cause any problems down the road. It seems that there was a very tiny bit of corrosion on one of those pins, so I'm glad I got that out. Now that everything was fully recapped, I wanted to loosely connect the display to the PowerBook to make sure everything worked before reassembling. Hooray, it does work. Thank goodness. I did not want to have to take that apart again. The display is looking pretty crisp, even though I had to film it from an odd angle here. Now it still has the original hard drive in there, but I know Luke will be replacing that with a blue SCSI on his own, so we'll just shut it down for now. Okay, great. Now that the display works, I can remove it and focus on the other problem with this machine, which is those cracking plastic posts that were supporting the display. This plastic was once strong and flexible, but now unfortunately it's very brittle and it needs additional support to make sure it could hold up that screen. Thankfully, somebody created these 3D brackets to help hold up the display. I'm using this one here and you'll find a link to that in the video description. So what we have to do here is remove all of the old hardware that was supporting the screen, these little screw mounts and all of that plastic. Once that has been removed, we could glue down these new 3D printed brackets and insert those screw mounts into there to allow the body of the PowerBook to properly support the weight of the screen and the hinges. But to put these on successfully, I have to do something pretty drastic and take a pair of flush cutters and chop away at all that remaining plastic. This is actually quite difficult as there's not a lot of wiggle room here for the tool to come in and cut all the plastic. I also made things a little bit more difficult as I decided to retain the other screw post to the right here because it was actually very sturdy. I did this on both sides of the display because I felt like it was very strong, although I did reinforce it with some glue just to make sure it didn't fail in the future. After using the flush cutter and the scalpel very carefully, I did get most of it off to where I was happy to start sanding the plastic down. I also cut the 3D printed bracket so it would fit there with that remaining screw post. Unfortunately, keeping those two remaining screw posts gave me a lot less room to work with when it came to cutting down and sanding down the plastic. However, the remaining posts acted as a guide and helped me align the display to the hinges later on. Now this is a trick that Colin of This Does Not Compute taught me. Essentially, if you hold over the screw post on the 3D printed piece, you could use a soldering iron to heat it up and just smoothly place in that screw post into the 3D printed part. Pretty smart, huh? and I think the results look fantastic. All right, now it's rinse and repeat and do the same exact thing, but for the other side. <laughs> 
I accidentally snapped off that little nub of a plastic there, and I originally wanted to glue it down. However, I found that gluing it down actually interfered with the replacement 3D printed hinge, so I ended up leaving it off anyway. It was a bit tight to sand everything down in this area, but it was needed because I had to make sure everything was flush so the new plastic piece could sit properly. Sanding this plastic would also help with adding glue later on. This would make sure that both surfaces were a bit rough and that the glue would adhere properly to both pieces. Since I wanted to retain that existing screw post, I had to cut the 3D printed part and then I had to sand it a little bit just to make sure it fit properly. Although it did take a bit of extra work, the left mount ended up fitting perfectly. And following similar steps, the right mount ended up fitting perfectly as well. This was the first time I attempted a plastic repair like this, so I was quite satisfied with the results. Now all I had to do was glue in those 3D printed pieces to the back of the display plastic. I used this Loctite plastics material that Colin used in his video because he had pretty good results with it. Now this glue bonds pretty quickly, so I wanted to make sure that I could line up everything as best I could in preparation for applying the glue. I used the straight edge of the packaging to act as a level to make sure that the middle of the screw posts were aligned and even on the back of the display. So I put the glue on and I aligned it as best I could. I still had to make minor adjustments because it was just slightly off, but thankfully I was able to do that before the glue fully dried. I then repeated this nerve wracking process on the other side of the power book. Thankfully, everything looks pretty straight and I was pretty happy with the results. I let the glue cure overnight to make sure everything was rock solid. Now you may have noticed that I actually altered that 3D model to make a little channel for this EMI shielding to fit through. Unfortunately, it didn't really solve the problem in the way that I thought it would. Thankfully, this is pretty much a cosmetic issue. So I just bent these little pieces under the display when I was reassembling things. Now it was time to reassemble the power book. Reinstalling the inverter board can be a bit of a challenge. You have to make sure that the little sliders on the board actually meet up with the back of the plastic sliders that will be on the outside of the power book. If those sliders aren't seated properly, the brightness and contrast control simply won't work and you'll have to disassemble the power book and try again. Now it was time to screw those hinges into the back of the power book and hope that everything would fit perfectly. You have to really be careful here though because the ribbing cable is there for the display and that inverter cable is there too. And if those aren't seated properly, when you put this thing back together, it just won't close up right. Thankfully, the hinges aligned perfectly and I was able to attach the display to the bottom of the power book. I took my time here to make sure that those hinges were angled correctly and that those delicate cables were routed properly. And to my great relief, everything looked like it was working perfectly. All that remained was connecting the bottom of the power book to the top case and the display. And would you look at that, a beautifully restored Macintosh PowerBook 165. And I have to say, that display looks gorgeous, especially for a lower cost display. When you get right into it, it just looks nice and crisp. And it's really not until you start moving text or windows around that you would notice some of those characteristics of a passive matrix screen. We have the picture settings of the display tuned in pretty well, as those brightness and contrast sliders are now working much better. When a screen like this is restored to its original condition, you can see just how usable they really are. Those 16 shades of gray practically leap out of the screen. These displays almost have an e-ink style display vibe going on that I quite like. So it's easy to see why a lower cost grayscale display option stuck around in Apple's PowerBook line all the way until late 1996. Well, there you have it. I think that PowerBook display looks quite nice. With the capacitors replaced on both the inverter board and the display, I think that this thing will last for a long time to come. And even though it's a passive matrix display, it doesn't really look too bad, especially if you dial in the brightness and contrast controls. Well, that's it for our PowerBook shenanigans today. Be sure to check out more Marchintosh content on Marchintosh.com. If you liked the video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel, and you can also follow me on social media. That's about it for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you right here next time on Mac 84.